take some iodine and have a seat, because in this video we're going to be playing with radioactive material. A few weeks ago, one of my Patreon subscribers asked me how he could use a vapor compression system to build a cloud chamber, and my first thought was... What the hell is a cloud chamber? Let's see what this newfangled robot AI thinks it is. Hmm. Hmm. Uh-huh. Interesting. Well, now I need to know more about this. Ah, okay, now it makes sense. Despite spending a large part of my day cruising DIY science videos, somehow I never heard of these things before, but I immediately wanted one. Basically, you've got a chamber that's filled with alcohol vapor, which evaporates from a soaked rag or gutter or something like that. The vapor is totally saturated, meaning it's like 100% humidity, except with alcohol vapor rather than water vapor. Then you've got a plate at the bottom that gets really cold, way below freezing temperature. This causes the alcohol vapor near the plate to cool below the point at which it would condense, which is called being super saturated. Now this super saturated vapor is unstable and it wants to condense, but it needs a nucleation site to do it. When a high energy particle like a super fast electron or an alpha particle zips through the chamber and bumps the alcohol molecules in its path, it ionizes them and provides a nucleation site for condensation, momentarily leaving behind a trail that looks a lot like an airliner's contrails. These particles are all around us. They come from cosmic rays in outer space. The three most common types we'll see in the cloud chamber are alpha, beta, and gamma particles. Alpha particles are helium nuclei, which are the most massive of the three, but also the easiest to stop. These make a thick trail that looks like a fuzzy white caterpillar. Beta particles are electrons traveling extremely fast, sometimes at relativistic speeds. These leave straight, sharp trails that are sometimes dashed or dotted. Because an electron has a very high charge to mass ratio, the beta particle can have its path bent into a spiral by a vertical magnetic field, as we can see from some of these old cloud chamber pictures here. Finally, there's gamma particles, which are actually just gamma rays, photons with ridiculously high energy. These have a frequency greater than 10 to the 19 hertz, which is around 10 billion times higher frequency than the microwave radiation you heat up your pot pockets with. These show up as thin squiggly lines in the cloud chamber. Okay, that's great, but how do we get the cloud chamber cold enough? Originally, dry ice was used to cool the chamber, but this gives you a very limited runtime, so more recently, a lot of people have used Peltier coolers. Unfortunately, Peltier coolers can't cool a very large area, and they're extremely inefficient and have a relatively short service life because thermal cycling will eventually cause them to crack. The best solution is a vapor compression system. This is relatively efficient and reliable, and even a small system can cool a relatively large surface. For mine, I just grabbed the system I had laying around from a previous video on Cascade Refrigeration. This came from a used ice maker I got for $50, and I just added a fill valve and a pressure gauge. With propane as a refrigerant and the correct expansion valve setting, I should be able to provide around 100 watts of cooling at somewhere around minus 20 to minus 30 C. For cooling down the cloud chamber plate, I made this flat coil with quarter inch copper tubing I got from the first condenser coil I used in my ethylene production video. This thing was overkill, so I didn't end up needing it for that project. I vacuumed out the system and filled it with propane from my grilling tank, then ran it up without insulation. It didn't take long to completely ice up the evaporator. I didn't have a way to solder copper to aluminum, so I just bonded the coil to my aluminum chamber plate with a bunch of silicone, then added some printed adapters to mount it on a frame. Then I painted it matte black, covered the bottom with glass wool insulation, and foil taped over the wool. I mounted the plate onto a frame made of some 20mm aluminum railing, and cut and painted a plywood board to mount the refrigeration parts on. Open to the air, the plate goes down to minus 13 C, and with an enclosure it'll go down to minus 23. The refrigeration system seems to be working well, so I printed a mount for this temperature gauge and another one for the condenser pressure gauge. There's also a printed mount for the fill valve and for the 16 volt supply to run the fan and lights, and a little strain relief thing for the mains cable for 120 volts. Then I printed this frame thing to hold the acrylic enclosure, which has recessed LED lights on the bottom. As you can see, it's really easy to dirty up the acrylic, so typically it's best to handle it with gloves. Unfortunately, my temperature gauge read Fahrenheit, even though it was advertised as Celsius when I bought it, and I couldn't find a way to change it, so that was kind of annoying. Anyway, I noticed there was a pretty big error between the temperature of the thermocouple I had mounted on the edge versus the one I had mounted in the middle. Later, I realized it was because the LED strip was pulling a whopping 25 watts at 16 volts, which was causing it to heat everything up, so I dialed it down to 9 volts. Of course, this meant I needed a separate power supply from the 16 volt DC converter, which I originally used, so that was kind of annoying. 
Now we need a source of alcohol vapor. For this I made a little PVC thing that I cut slots in kind of like a gutter and had some little clamps to hold paper towels to soak up the alcohol because these would provide way more surface area for evaporation. I got this particular idea from a channel called Cloudy Labs which has a bunch of different cloud chamber builds that are museum quality so check them out if you want to see some really detailed build techniques. Then I put a fill port for a funnel at the top of the acrylic enclosure which will allow me to add alcohol. There's also a little plug so it can seal shut. The gutter is held in place by some two-part brackets that I 3D printed. The top part of the bracket is stuck to the enclosure with silicon caulk and the bottom part screws in to secure the gutter. Alright, let's fire it up and try to find some particles. After a few minutes, I'm down to minus 25 C. The plate becomes wet with condensed alcohol and it actually starts to rain near the bottom of the chamber. After about 20 minutes, I finally see something interesting. The unmistakable trail of an alpha particle. Looks like there's also a gamma and a few seconds later another alpha. The trails are actually easier to see from about a 45 degree angle since a lot of the condensation is just falling directly down instead of horizontally outwards. But the trails are still pretty blurry, not very well defined against the background. I guess I should have used some primer on my paint too because it started to blister up when the alcohol soaked it. Alright, let's try a more dramatic display. I've decided to be dangerous and got an old camera lens with thorium-232 in it. This was a fairly common thing in fancy cameras in the 1970s. It had something to do with enhancing the optical properties of the glass. Now you're probably wondering why somebody would deliberately put a radioactive object in front of their eyeball, but you have to remember that people back then bought rocks as pets, considered this acceptable interior design, and smoked on board airplanes. We don't need a Geiger counter to verify that this little guy is definitely radioactive. That's pretty fun to watch, but my particle trails still look really blurry. I've read that this is caused by residual ionization that just lingers around the trail even after the particle is long gone. Supposedly the solution is to flush these ions out with a vertical electric field. So I bent this simple loop of copper tubing as a high voltage electrode, and the chamber plate will be the grounded electrode. I used tubing instead of wire because it has a larger radius making corona discharge less likely. Corona discharge will create a wind inside the chamber and ruin the view of the trails. It's pretty easy to make a high voltage source, but I just got an electric fly swatter for $3 because I was lazy. Inside the swatter is a high voltage transformer with a rectifier and a small capacitor. It works, but it's not very impressive. I doubt the voltage is more than 1 or 2,000. So instead, I dug through my junk drawer and fished out the ZVS driver and flyback transformer from my lightning tower video. Details on that circuit are in the video. As you can see, this thing has a lot more voltage and doesn't draw much current on 16 volts when it's idling. I also added a 4x voltage multiplier so I could bump the 7,000-ish volts up to nearly 30,000. This also rectifies the AC coming out of the flyback. I added 20 mega ohms of resistance in series so that I wouldn't die if I touched the output by accident. There'd be less than 2,000 volts of drop on each resistor if the output was shorted, so it shouldn't be able to jump across the resistors once the circuit is insulated. I insulated the multiplier in epoxy, but the very top layer was still sticky 24 hours later so I put a little cap over it and sealed it off. Here's the high voltage stuff mounted by the chamber. When I turn on the electric field, a mist immediately appears inside the chamber. I think this is because some current is leaking through the soaked paper towels you see on the sides. The alcohol is 99% isopropyl, so the high voltage must be jumping through that 1% water. Either that or the fibers of the paper towel are ever so slightly conductive. The mist does look kinda neat though. Looks like the electric field did indeed sharpen the trail somewhat. I think they'd be sharper if the field was uniformly applied across a whole grid parallel to the plate instead of just a single outer loop though.
I mentioned earlier that I should be able to bend the path of a beta particle with a strong magnetic field since it's a charged particle in motion, so I stuck this 40 by 40 N52 magnet in the chamber. I started to see this donut shaped halo on the bottom of the magnet before any particles showed up. I'm not sure whether that has anything to do with the magnetic field or just the fact that it's a big lump of material causing vapor to condense there. Unfortunately, I never saw any particles appear with the magnet inside the chamber because I think it was providing all the nucleation sites. Even when I moved the magnet outside of the chamber, I never noticed it curving any of the trails. Let's look at just the ambient radiation now that I've got the electric field to sharpen the picture a little bit. You can definitely see a lot more of the smaller beta and gamma particles now, but the picture is still fuzzy, so to speak, from all the alcohol rain in the background. Let's try another radioactive source. This is autonite, autentite? I don't know how to pronounce it. It's a mineral that has calcium and phosphorus bonded to uranium. Before I started to see particles, these weird curtains of condensation started to appear. I don't know if this was from leakage discharge from the electric field or from radioactivity. After about 20 minutes, I can start to see a lot of trails coming off the autonite. This one seems to emit more beta and gamma particles, where the thorium seemed to be mostly alpha particles. There's a whole other range of weird displays that seem to be generated just from the electric field in the chamber. Here I attached a pointed electrode to the loop and generated a strong wind from the corona discharge. When the fog settled, it would form this weird hole that would slowly shrink when I turned off the field. With the high voltage electrode and the big magnet, more strange patterns appeared in the mist. I have no clue what's going on here, but it's certainly interesting to watch. For my last experiment with the chamber, I wanted to do something totally unrelated to the rest of the video. I was really curious to see if I could make soft, fluffy snow inside the chamber by using one of those ultrasonic mist generators and then freezing the atomized water. I printed this adapter to go on top of a water glass, which has baffles to prevent larger water droplets from getting out, and a mount for a fan that draws out the mist. Between the low temperatures and the mist, it definitely makes the chamber very foggy. When I run the fan fast enough, it even creates a little blizzard of snow inside. So here's what it did after about 20 minutes. The seal on my adapter leaked, so lots of larger water droplets dripped out, causing solid chunks of ice on the right side of the plate, which I didn't want. The snow looks okay though, not bad for 20 minutes. I fixed my leak and ran again for about an hour. This time I managed to get a beautiful blanket of fluffy snow that was about 4 or 5 millimeters thick. This actually had the consistency of natural snow. I think my snow yield is limited by the relatively small contact area provided by the cold plate of the chamber. If I were to make a dedicated system, I'd probably use my refrigeration system to cool airflow in a large duct to below freezing temperature and then draw up the water mist from a reservoir with multiple ultrasonic misters by the Venturi effect and allow the components to mix. This would allow much better heat transfer than a fixed plate. Maybe I'll use this to make a snowman on the beach in the near future. As for the chamber, I think I'll probably change the geometry a bit so that the field is provided by a high voltage grid on top and the alcohol source is just a single soaked paper towel laid flat across the top. This way I can just put one of these nice looking glass bells on top without having to worry about running wires through or opening a port to fill the alcohol. 
It's okay if the top of the chamber is obstructed, because the best view of the trail seems to occur at an angle rather than looking directly down from the top. Anyway, thanks for watching, and if you liked this video, consider subscribing. And if you really, really liked the video, you can support the channel through my Patreon, which helps me buy things like this. Or this. Or whatever this thing is. Do they sell those? Or, or this. Anyway, bye.